Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to episode 42 of the video series in which we program an entire video game from scratch in the C programming language using no engines, practically no libraries. Everything is just our code. Here we go. So in episode 41, we introduced uh, multi-threading and we also finished up, well, I say finished up the asset loading code, even though it's it's not quite finished yet. Uh, there's a couple more tweaks that we need to make, uh, and we're also going to continue on uh, our um, introduction to uh, multi-threading. Um, but before we get started with that, um, I want you to look over here at the GitHub repository, and uh, we have a pull request. So let me click on pull request, and we'll see what happens. We have one. Um, looks like uh, Crystal Tokyo has opened a pull request. There is a cat in a bag behind me. Uh, Crystal Tokyo has opened up a pull request that says added error message for mini Z functions. Biscuit. <laughs> uh, okay, um, yeah, so let's look at the files changed. All right, so here is here are the changes. The, the red is the old and the green is the new. And all they're doing is they are converting the mini Z error into string format, and then we can log that as well. And that's all they're changing, which is great. I see no problems with that, so I intend to merge this pull request. It's it's good. It's fine. Uh, I do see one bad thing though, is that uh, assets dot dat, um, assets dot dat should not have been part of this pull request. Um, and I know that that the um, person who submitted this pull request didn't mean for assets.dat to get roped into here. The only reason that assets.dat got marked as a changed file is because of our post build step, uh, copy assets.bat, that batch file. It runs as a post build step, so it runs every time we build the game. Um, so there's probably two problems there. A, we don't need to be building that file, that assets file, after every build um, because if it hasn't changed if we haven't added any additional assets there's no reason to rebuild the assets file so all that's doing is making the build take longer so um, we should probably fix that and then number two what we need to do is probably add that well I don't know if I want to add this to my git ignore or not if I added this to my git ignore then it, assets.dat would never get uploaded uh, to the repository. Um, how that would that would mean that you know you would have to build it yourself. You would have to make your own assets.dat file. Um, is that really what I want? I don't know. So I think the first thing I'll do. Well, first thing I'll do is I need to merge this into master. So, which I think I can do, I've got the GitHub desktop app over here, current repository game B, current branch master, choose a branch to merge into master, PR5, I hope I'm doing the right thing. Okay, resolve conflicts, um, use the modified file from master, okay, so we're resolving this conflict assets.dat which is you know doesn't matter it shouldn't exist um, all right commit merge there we go um, push origin merged okay cool so we completed that uh, pull request. And if you look here in main.c, merge branch PR5, 
you'll notice that we do now in fact have the the new changes um, in our master branch which is cool alright so we merged that thank you Crystal Tokyo for that contribution let's open this now in Visual Studio and see what we can do okay first things first I want to go to the properties of this project and I want to I think I'm probably just going I'm probably just going to I'm probably just going to remove that for the time being. Um, I may put it back later. I may not. Um, and that should put an end to um, unnecessarily updating the assets that file when we don't need to. Okay. Um, so let's go back down to All right, so this is in load asset from archive. This is the load asset from archive function. Um, I'll do you one better. Uh, I can actually, we can actually just get rid of this variable altogether. And that should do it. Okay, I think that does it for that. Okay, so this brings up another issue. Um, now that we now that we have two threads, and let me go ahead and let me go ahead and draw for you these these threads. Uh, okay, here we go. We have our main thread right here. And this is the the passage of time from left to right. This is win main right here. So this is when the program first starts up. We have one thread in our game. As of last episode, we started a new thread, and it starts somewhere down in win main, right about we'll say right about here. It starts, and then it goes and it loads all of the assets. And that let's say that it takes that amount of time, and then it stops. So, well, I wish, yeah, there, let's see. We have some text here. We'll call it asset loading thread. And this is called main thread. Makes sense. Okay, so during this uh, period of time, During this period of time, we are displaying the uh, splash screen, right? So hopefully, all that makes sense. Um, but what I, the thing, the problem that I want to address right now is that since we have two different threads, and not only do we have two different threads, but we have the situation where if I go to asset loading thread. There's two things I want to do to asset loading thread today. Uh, first, you'll see that it logs messages. This is an issue because now we have thread A and thread B are both logging messages. So we have two separate threads that are both logging messages to the same output log file. And remember, as I mentioned in the last episode, anytime you have more than one thread that could be potentially accessing the same data, you need to synchronize or serialize the access to that data. The data in this situation would be that log file. Uh, we do not want to have two different threads 
uh, attempting to write to the same log file at the same time. Um, not only would that cause, I mean, the, the, the best case would be that the log messages will appear out of order, but the worst case is that we get a corrupted log file or even a program crash. So we need to fix that. Secondly, I want to get rid of all of these message boxes. Um, and this is just sort of a, a contract that I want to make with myself that I don't want this thread, this asset loading thread, to cause any sort of graphical user interface elements. I, I don't want any sort of GUI to happen on this thread. So all of this message box, because it pops up a modal dialog box that you have to click on, uh, I don't want that to occur on this thread. So what we can do instead is we can check the result of, we can check the exit code of this thread uh, back on the other thread whenever this thread finishes. So one thing at a time though, let's go ahead and go all the way back up here probably to I'm not sure if I want to do this in main.c or main.h. I'll start with main.c first. Um, we have to make a new handle, and we're going to call it g log crit sec. So we're going to make a critical section. And what is a critical section, you ask? A critical section is simply it's simply a um, synchronization mechanism that allows only one thread to execute a certain piece of code at a time. So the idea is is that if you have a single piece of code that can be run by multiple threads, you can protect this area of code by saying I want to enter this critical section and as long as one thread in your entire process is currently inside that critical section of the code no other thread may enter that same part of the critical section until your original thread leaves the critical section so it's a it's a gating it's a gating mechanism it's a way to gate access so that only one thread can go through at a time it's like a like a turnstile or you know like a a, a switch on a on a railroad track you know that sort of thing um, so let's look up how to use these things. Um, I know you have to initialize a critical section first, so let's do that. Um, Win32 enter critical section. Let's blow this up a little bit. Or actually, let's go straight to using critical section objects. Initialize the critical section one time only. That's what we need right there. Initialize critical section and spin count. Uh, that's what we'll do. Okay, so starting in win main, we'll do initialize critical section and spin count and specifying our log critical section and spin count is an interesting interesting topic the spin count is the number of cycles the that a thread is willing to wait on this critical section before entering basically a deep sleep so it's a it's a performance optimization basically so if I basically I'm saying I'll I will I will spin like on the CPU waiting for this critical section to become available up until this many cycles and if that many cycles have elapsed and the critical section is still not available then I'm going to go the thread is just going to go to sleep waiting on that the 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 concept is that if I spin and then I get allowed into the critical section, then I've, I avoid having to go to sleep. I avoid um, context switching. I avoid getting uh, 
I avoid um, having to schedule in a, a new thread and I basically it it basically allows me to um, proceed on this thread without having to um, yield the rest of my of my time slice to another thread. I hope that makes sense. So the next question naturally would be well what is the optimal spin count? What is the optimal amount of time that we should wait? Um, and the answer is there is no one single answer. Um, it all depends on what you're doing inside that critical section and it depends on um, how, how fast the CPU is. Um, it depends on several different factors as to what the optimal time would be would be to make this uh, spin count. So, you know, I had a thought at one point where you could basically sort of make a self-tuning, self-tuning critical section. If you measured how long your critical section took in terms of CPU cycles, in 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 the real world as your program executed, and based on that, you could you could basically tune the uh, spin count of your critical section to where it would most closely align with how many CPU cycles your critical section really required. It'd be like if it took longer than this many cycles then something is probably you know you probably need to just go to sleep uh, because the critical section is not likely to be available um, within that many within that many cycles. Nah. I don't know. Um, so we may we may revisit this later because I don't know if that is really the optimal number of of cycles for our critical section to wait. I'm still thinking about it. Let me look it up. Okay, the spin count for the critical section object on single processor systems, the spin count is ignored and the critical, critical section count is always zero. On multiprocessor systems, if the critical section is unavailable, the calling thread will spin for this many times before performing a wait operation on a semaphore associated with critical section. If the critical section becomes free during the spin count, the calling thread avoids the wait operation which like I said that's good that means there's no context switching involved your thread is still spinning on the processor and then as soon as the critical section is available your thread gets to continue into and go into the critical section without having to wait without having to let another thread switch in all that good stuff um, yeah see this this remark section this is what this is what's really nice about MSDN or docs.microsoft.com and the Windows API documentation is typically really good and if you read you really need to read this remarks section because they usually have some really interesting info in the remarks section I think there's a bit of a discussion in here the spin count is useful for critical sections of short duration that can experience high levels of contention, consider a worst case scenario in which an application on a multiprocessor system has two or three threads constantly allocating and releasing memory from the heap. The application serializes heap with a critical section. In the worst case, contention is constant and each thread makes processor intensive call to wait for single object C. You generally want to avoid calling wait for single object if you don't have to. However, if the spin count is set properly, the calling thread does not immediately call wait for single thread object when contention occurs. Yeah, we know that. Choose a small spin count of short duration. The heap manager uses a spin count of roughly 4,000 for its per heap critical sections. Well, we're using 1024 here, aren't we? Which is even smaller than 4,000. 
So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let me see. What does this return? This function always succeeds and returns a non-zero value. This critical section is used to synchronize access to the log file vis-a-vis. -vis. Should I use words like vis-a-vis -vis in my comments? That's a that's extra. Um, log message A. When used by multiple threads simultaneously. Uh, okay. All right. So we initialized our critical section. The compiler might actually, even though we just read off of MSDN that this function always succeeds, never fails, therefore it isn't important for us to check the return code of this function. Nevertheless, the compiler doesn't know that and it might complain, hey, you're calling this function, but you're ignoring the return value. So we may have to revisit this uh, next time we build. Um, but let's go to log message, log message A. Okay, here we go, we're doing all this stuff. And basically, you want your critical section to be as small as possible, right? It just makes sense that if you're, if you're going to serialize access so that only one thread in your process may execute this code at one time, it would make sense that you want your critical section to be as small as possible, right? So when I look at all these things, all of this stuff, it's okay. For multiple threads to be executing this stuff at the same time all this stuff is fine it's all this stuff is fine 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 it really isn't until it's not until we get to this create file right here that we want to start serializing our access we only want one thread to be able to access this file at, at the same time right so I'm going to enter critical section right here G log critsec. Now, once you've entered it, you need to leave it. And I'm trying to decide, okay. There is no possible way that we, there's no other way that we could leave this function without exiting the critical section. Leave critical section there. Now, if this function, I mean, other than like that right there, but that does that crashes the the entire program, so that doesn't matter. Um, there are other situations where, if this function had been more complex and had had, if this function had had um, multiple multiple paths which could have returned from this function then I would have to do something like um, I would have to do something like make a boolean here um, that's like where is it here bool crit sec own equals false and then as soon as I enter the critical section I would do crit sec Crit sec own equals true, and then everywhere where I could exit the function, I would have to do something like, you know, if crit sec own. I don't know why IntelliSense doesn't like that crit sec own. You know, then um, you know I might have to do something like that, but I, I don't have to do something like that on this function. Um, I just wanted to point that out because it's very important that the whole the, the idea is it's very important that you never leave a critical section orphaned or that you never stay you you never want to get yourself into a situation where your thread still owns the critical section even when it it shouldn't even when it should have released it I mean because it, you can hold this critical section forever 
and no other thread will ever be able to get into it and then your entire process will go into a deadlock as soon as you try to log something and that's how you get an application hang and I debug those all the time at work um, but here I think we're safe to just we're entering it we're doing stuff to the file we're closing the file and then we're leaving the critical section and there is no way to there's no way to leave this function without leaving this critical section so I think I've done it I mean I think that's that's as as compact and discreet as we can make our critical section looks good okay so now what, what we've done is we've made by by using this critical section we've made our log message a function thread safe in that we can we can have multiple threads calling log message a at the same time and we don't have to worry about them trying to write to the file at the same time I hope that makes sense all right um, back to asset loading thread so now we don't have to worry about we don't have to worry about the thread safety of this we can get rid of I'm gonna get rid of all these message box a functions because like I said I don't want this background thread or what I feel like should be a background thread I don't want it to be causing any uh, GUI I don't want it to be causing any um, what you what you call it um, you know graphical message boxes nothing like that um, Okay, log message, log message, log message. I'm just going to make sure all these are consistent. And now that since we're talking about consistency, build with 0x percent. Since we have an error code, I should log the error code. even though I probably already logged the error code in the load asset from file function it doesn't hurt to log it again here Just some copying and pasting here. Oh, and I think I did this probably off camera. I moved all of the hero uh, sprite bitmap loading into load asset uh, into this thread proc as well. Asset loading thread proc. I moved that here. Loading. Almost done. Um, apologies for the uh, tediousness, but sometimes that's what programming is. Be 
paste. Copy. Two. I feel like I don't know what I feel like right now. Okay, loading that. Zero, so zero left walk two, left walk one, left standing, down walk two, down walk one, down standing, overworld, overworld og, and you choose wave. Okay, I think this is done. Okay, good. I think that all works out fine. Oh, I just reminded myself. I need to change this from all configuration. Yeah. So I still had the build the post build step enabled for other configurations and other platforms. I needed to make sure and move this to all configurations and all platforms first uh, before I cleared that out. I don't know why that just randomly popped into my head. But there you have it. Um, okay, so there's one other thing that I want to do here before we're really done with this. Um, okay, done with this. Uh, okay, there is some code down here. There is some code down here somewhere. This code that we worked on last time where I decided that I wanted to load these two assets in particular on the main thread instead of loading them in instead of loading them in uh, the the background asset loading thread that we created. And the reason why is because while the asset loading thread takes place in the background while the splash screen is playing, but the splash screen can't be displayed if I don't at least have these two assets loaded. Um, well, I thought about that, and it turns out I don't want to do this. I don't want to load any assets at all on any other thread other than our asset loading thread. So I'm going to remove that code. It just makes our win main function that much cleaner. And I'm going to go to asset loading thread proc. And I'm going to load these two assets first. Um, I'm going to remove that comment because that becomes irrelevant. And I'm going to I'm going to employ yet another thread synchronization trick and I'm going to call it uh, or I'm going to use uh, events so it's just another handle it's an event
and I'm going to put it down here. Okay, this critical section is used to synchronize. I think I'm missing an H. Synchronize logging. Okay, something new. Uh, we need a, uh, what are we going to call it? We're going to call it um, splash screen assets loaded event. That's a bit excessive. Um, Essential assets loaded event. Okay. I think that works. So the idea is, is that I'm going to all right, hang on. Yeah, we need to create this event here. Uh, create a manual reset event object. The write thread sets this object to a signaled state when it finishes writing to a shared buffer. We are going to set this event to a signaled state after we have loaded the essential resources, uh, essential assets. And what, what is an essential asset? It, it's basically assets that I need in order to, uh, in order to like create the splash screen. So right now it's just the 6x7 font and that weird annoying sound. Are the only two assets that I need to make the splash screen happen. But later on, if we, you know, make the splash screen more interesting uh, down the road, it may be we may add other assets to that. Um, but as for right now, instead of just saying this, I should I should comment this. Um, this event gets signal slash set after the most essential assets have been loaded and then I'm going to clarify essential means the assets required to do required to um, render the splash screen Okay, and I can tell you right now that um, uh, I'm probably going to have to move this out into main.h um, because I'm probably going to have to reference it in draw overworld.c. That's my current thinking. Um, but before that happens, I need to create this event. And I'm going to do it right here. This is called uh, G essential assets loaded event equals create event with regular security attributes. This is a manual reset event. The initial state is non signaled. And then it needs an object name, which is going to be something like we'll just call it that. Um, and this will be creative event A. Going to add the same comment to it. Uh, 
Oh, you know what though? I'm going to cut both of these out because I don't like putting code before my function before my function declarations. Okay, I like to have all my I mean, sorry, variable declarations. I like to declare all my variables first before the code starts. And again, it isn't strictly necessary. It used to be necessary in like the original C standard, like C89 or something like this. It's not necessary anymore, but I still like to do it. I like to declare all my variables at the very beginning of the scope in which they are used. Uh, it's just a habit. All right, so there we go. Done with that. Created the event. And then in asset loading thread proc, okay, in asset loading thread proc, we, this is a background thread. We're going to load this. We're going to load that. And then after that happens, we're going to set the event. Because now we're going to say G essential there. Now we're going to go let me go ahead and take that out put it in main.h instead wherever the rest of my variables are Oh yeah, I need to comment these. I need to comment all of these. Okay. Uh, now, how do we check? How do we check whether the event is signaled or not? Is it just Yeah, there it is. You can you can wait on it forever, or you could do the same thing we did last time, where you can call wait for single object, specifying a timeout of zero. And if you do it that way, it is actually a non-blocking call, and it will simply tell you what the state of that event is right now. So let's do that way. If I go back to overworld.c, no wait, sorry, splash screen dot C how do I want to do this I basically want to defer I want to I want to I kind of want to make this just not happen. Like, I don't want this to happen if splash screen hasn't been loaded yet. Like, if the splash screen sound hasn't been loaded yet, and I don't want to do, I don't want to do this if six by seven font hasn't been loaded yet. But I also want to make sure that if the loading of those assets takes a long time, I want to make sure that this this happens. It just gets pushed later you know later in time um, I don't want to for I mean what I'm in other words what I'm trying to say is I don't want to miss um, local frame counter equals 120 I don't want to miss that event I don't want to miss that that moment uh, because then our our game sound will never play um, so I could just
well, I mean, I, I could just do this. Uh, wait for single object g essential assets loaded event zero. And if that does not equal wait object zero, that means if it's not signaled, then return. I mean, just return. Let's try that first. I mean, I think that's going to be fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's run it and make sure it works. Build started. Build running. Uh, you might have an issue here. Unreferenced label. Intro critical section. Okay, I think that worked fine. I have my my audio is not on speaker, so I couldn't hear it. But it, you probably did hear it. Um, but I did not because my speakers were off. Um, but first, let me finish. Let me let me fix these. Uh, let me fix these warnings. Uh, there it is. Remember, I told you about this. Return value ignored. Uh, initialize critical section and spin count. Um, okay. So there is a pragma warning suppress. I think pragma warning suppress that basically just disables the warning for just this one line. pushes the current state, disables specified warning for the next line, and then pops the warning stack so that the pragma state is reset. So yeah, that's what I need is like a, how do you use it? Pragma, warning, suppress, uh, 6031. Is that how it works? I kind of want to find an example of how to use it. Pragma warning, Press pragma warning. Of course, of course, it doesn't give me an example of suppress. Pragma warning suppress. Yeah, that seems to be exactly how you use it. By the way, um, these pragmas they don't work with uh, other compilers other than. Um, Visual Studio, this is the, the compiler, is technically cl.exe. Uh, Visual Studio is the whole IDE experience. But, um, for example, somebody left a comment last time. They were saying they're trying to compile this with GCC, and um, they're noticing that these pragma, pragma, these pragma warning things, uh, pre-compiler directives, don't work with GCC, and... Sorry, that was my cell phone. Uh, yeah, and that's that's right. They don't; these don't work with GCC. You have to find something else. And there, there are you can disable you can disable warnings on the command line with GCC. But I don't think there is an equivalent with for these pragmas in GCC. Um, you know, please, if I'm wrong, you know, go ahead and correct me. But I think you have to use like. Uh, I'll go ahead and look it up. I should have done this at the beginning of the episode since it was a viewer comment, and I typically address viewer comments at the beginning of the episode, but uh, Pragma Warning Disable GCC. Stack Overflow. Mm. 
All right, so I don't know. You might be able to use... Push, ignored. Yeah, but the, the warning won't have the same numerical code as it does in Visual Studio. So I don't know if you know how to suppress it, basically do the equivalent of this in GCC, do the equivalent of what I'm doing here, um, please let me know. But as of this current moment, I don't actually care because I don't have any plans of using GCC right now. Um, let me make sure this actually worked before I before I you know, act triumphant. Still building. There, that error went away, which is nice. And I'll 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 make a comment as to why I'm suppressing the error. Uh, documentation says this function never fails therefore checking its return code is not important all right now this probably okay are you sure did I did I am I doing something wrong here levels of redirection handle pointer okay you say you need an LP which is long pointer LP stands for long pointer to a critical section and what do I have I have a Yeah, so that code should be correct, I would think. Let me look it up one more time. Initialize critical section and spin count. Uh, let me see. Oh, look, here's a stack overflow overflow question on the optimal spin count see the choice of spin count depends very critically no pun intended on the duration of the critical section so I think you'd have to test to find your optimal spin count um, but that's not what we're after right now see everyone wants to know what is a good value for the spin count uh, you just have to measure it and see for yourself. Uh, measure your critical section. Time it. Profile it. Is there not a section for using initialized critical section? What is a critical section? Oh, goodness. All right, let's try that. Instead of using a handle, let's use an actual critical section, which probably boils down to the same thing, but let's give it a try. Okay, that was probably the source of my confusion is that I was using a handle instead of an actual critical section object. That probably does it. All right, let's get rid of this. Exit unreferenced label. This is an in initialize hero, uh, which is a function that we haven't thought about in a long time. Um, and the reason why it's complaining about an unreferenced label is because uh, I used to have all of the 
load 32 BPP bitmap from file uh, stuff in there and I used to jump to this label but I just stopped doing that so uh, obviously we're gonna revisit that function at a later time so don't care um, also we're not using uh, parameters LP param so that can go and then function oh interesting conversion from int to mz underscore uint32 signed unsigned mismatch now I think this is this is in mini z which I, I remember I'm not really interested in, sh in, in trying to quote unquote fix mini z because uh, it's not my code and we know mini z works fine I'm, I'm not really interested in trying to rid mini z of all of the, its compiler warnings mz zip okay so see this is one of the constants that we changed mz underscore zip underscore end of central dir header sig remember that we changed all of the headers uh, so that it could only be so that the compressed archive could only be opened by our own game and you wouldn't be able to open it with just a regular tool like WinZip or WinRAR or 7-Zip or something like this but I think in so doing I think that in while we were changing these constants I just was changing them randomly and I think I accidentally changed one of them from a positive integer to a negative integer on accident um, now does it really matter no but do I if I go back and change it to something else all right let's from int to mz you see it, it's expecting a you a, an unsigned int and I'm giving it a signed int so let's go back here interesting there we go so that's what it used to be right, so what if I change this back to 06 which now changes that back to a positive number see when the most significant byte is a seven there it is it's negative one four nine something or other I changed the byte back to 06 and that changes it back to a positive number which I think is what I should that's that's why I accidentally generated that um, compiler warning the problem is now that um, I have to go back to mini Z and change it back there as well and then I have to rebuild our assets file so let me go ahead and do that uh, my mini Z Let's go ahead and change that back to, oh look, it's already right here. Uh, let's change that back to, change this byte back to 06. Build, rebuild. No central dir header sig.
What did I do? Okay, that did get rid of the signed, unsigned, mismatch warning. So I rebuilt that. I'm going to close that now. I'm going to go to here, users, source, repos, my mini Z. I'm going to go to x64, release. I'm going to grab this. Copy, back up to game B, paste it back into here, replace. Okay. All right, that's fixed. While that build is happening, I need to go and rebuild. I need to rebuild the assets file because um, we have a new version of my mini Z now. So it has a different header signature in it. So I need to rebuild the. I need to rebuild that. Um, edit. Yeah, all that stuff is still fine. Okay, now we're back to compiling without errors again. Everything's working fine. All right, now there's one last thing I want to do. Since we're over time, there's one last thing I want to do. I think everything, I did everything I wanted to do today, with the exception of an opening splash screen. Well, there is, there is one other thing I wanted to do. We're going to go here in opening splash screen. We're going to say if the asset loading thread is done, then we want to get thread exit code. What's it called? Get thread no. Check. How do you how do you check for the exit code of a thread? Um, then 32 get thread exit code. Get exit code thread retrieves the termination status of the specified thread. A pointer to a variable to receive the thread termination status, which is a D word. Okay. So D word thread ex exit code equals error success we're going to say get exit code thread. It needs the asset loading thread handle. It needs a pointer to the exit thread exit code. And we're going to say if thread exit code is not error success, Then we are going to complain, which I know we've already complained in the asset loading thread, but we're going to complain again here on this thread, on our main thread. Where's my percent sign? G 
asset or asset loading thread failed with zero x percent or just my percent size zero right, percent lx. And we are going to fail. We are going to fail miserably. And we're going to set G um, game is um, no. What are we going to do? How are we going to make this fail? We're going to go to main.c. We're going to go here. Game is running. We're going to move this into main.h. I don't know why draw overworld is even here. Here we go. G game is. Why do we have game is already running? Oh, it's a function. Yeah, I know what that function is. Um, all right, we don't want that. We want game. G game is running equals. We're gonna set that to false. So that will that will signal the main thread message loop to stop and the program will exit. Uh, game window. Text. Asset loading failed. Check log for more details. Caption will be error, and the type will be message box OK, message box error, or icon error, I think is how it goes. All right. Okay, let's see if it runs now. Oh, I think I forgot to set G game is running. No, I said it's true. So let's just let this build run. Everything is still working perfectly fine. Okay, so um, that's kind of cool. Uh, today we worked on a couple more um, multi-threading issues, which. You know, like I said, when we did the introduction to multi-threading in the last episode, um, everything gets more interesting and more complicated when you introduce more than one thread, um, which we have now done. And now that we have done it, I don't even know if we're going to need another thread other than the one we just created for asset loading. Um, I still want to do this uh, drawing the loading text thing, which we'll do. I'm going to do like a little, maybe a little blinking cursor. In fact, you know what, maybe I'll just go ahead and, maybe I'll just go ahead and, and do that now, even though we're over time. Um, let's do a blip string. What is that funny uh, character? First we need a, that funny, that funny character is like, what is it again? We had it in the options screen, so let me go look at the options screen. That funny character, yes, it is F2. Oops, F2. I'll put it in splash screen. Yeah, just to make sure that it's still, okay. 
and then we're going to draw that using uh, G six by seven font. But only if, okay, obviously that's not going to happen until we have loaded, until our essential assets loaded event has been signaled. So we don't have to worry about the 6x7 font not being there while we're trying to draw this font, or else the game would crash, right? Uh, and then the color is going to be something like uh, pixel 32. 0x something, right? Then we need an x and a y. Um, the x is going to be game res width minus 6, I think. And then the y is going to be game res height minus 7. Right, because I want to put it in the uh, bottom right hand corner of the screen. So I think those are my proper x, y coordinates. Um, all right, now what, what color do I want this to be? Let's just do um, color do I want this to be? Let's do 32. So I want it to be like a dark gray color. Except alpha, which is going to be 255. Is it BGRA or ARGB? I can never remember. Let's run that and see what it looks like. This is not what I want at all. Because this is only going to run if the counter is over 240 frames, which is nonsense. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. I want this to happen regardless of the local frame counter. So I'm going to put it there. Let's try it again. There it is. That looks like in the exact right spot. Um, now we need a static bool. And we're going to call it blink. And we're going to say if local, oh, um, no, we're going to do, see, I can't rely on, I need it, I'm going to use total frames rendered, and I'm going to do it in, uh, I'm going to do some modulo arithmetic here. How fast do I want it to blink? Twice a second? So we'll do, if the total number of frames rendered divided by 30 has a remainder of zero, which means, which is another way of saying every 30 frames, I'm going to do blink equals not blink. So I'm basically just reversing it twice a second, right? And then we'll say if blink, then do that. So I think what that will do is it'll say every like every twice a second you should see the little cursor thing blinking down in the bottom and that will say that that's to say that our assets are still loading. Uh, I want to do if blink 
Hold on. And... I don't know, let's just run it and see what happens. Yeah, we get a blinking gray cursor down here. Oh, and one other thing. I only want my blinky text, my, my blinky cursor to show up on the bottom of the screen as long as the asset loading thread has not yet completed. So I'm adding another call to wait for single object here uh, because that way if the assets have completed loading then our blinky cursor thing, our loading thing will disappear. It'll stop, it'll stop appearing on the screen. So um, that will happen independently of the, of the splash happening in the middle of the screen and the text fading and all this kind of stuff. So um, all, you see, basically these two things are, are happening asynchronously. So I'm going to call it for today. Uh, we're over time. As always, ooh, 120. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, if you would like to continue uh, seeing me uh, finish this game, um, like and subscribe to this video uh, and make comments. If you have any comments, uh, please leave them on the video. I will address any, any interesting comments in an upcoming video. Don't forget that we have a GitHub repository uh, that you can use to follow along at home and I think that is it so until next time I'll see you in a few days thanks for watching bye